It is Friday, July 29th. Let's talk PlayStation. All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, yet again, another very interesting week here for PlayStation News. So uh, let's start off, as always, with our PS Plus reminder. Those July PS Plus games, grab them before they go away. This is your final notice and warning. August 2nd, it's going to change over to Yakuza Like a Dragon on PS4 and PS5, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 Plus 2, the deluxe bundle, and that includes the PS4 and PS5 versions, and then also Little Nightmares on PS4 which this is a very good solid month for sure. Um, I'm loving the energy that we're seeing out of PS Plus Essential since the uh, PS Plus relaunch. And so I, I hope it stays like this because so far, um, great titles all around. And in terms of Yakuza, good segue to our first story here, we've got more PS Plus news, but Sony confirmed more Yakuza games are coming to PlayStation Plus outside of just Like a Dragon and Essential. So uh, next month for Extra and Premium, we're gonna get Yakuza 0, Kiwami and Kiwami 2, and then later this year, uh, Yakuza 3, 4, and 5 Remastered are coming as well. But small little caveat, those will only be available on PS Plus Premium, which um, that is a bit weird, but we have to remember that Sony has some, you know, unique language here when they refer to classic games on PS Plus Premium because that does include PS1, 2, PSP, but also remasters or remakes that are natively, you know, made and ported to PS4. So we've got, you know, PS3, uh, you know, PSP games on that tier that had native ports to uh, PlayStation 4. And so it's a little bit strange, but those games are considered uh, classic titles. And unfortunately, that's where the uh, three remastered Yakuza games, uh, that's where they fit in. But there's that and then Yakuza 6 The Song of Life that'll be on extra and premium and so if you are a premium member you should be able to play <laughs> all the Yakuza games uh, or most of them I should say within that franchise uh, by the end of this year so uh, and believe me these are fantastic games so um, if you've never tried one of them before this is a great opportunity to at least play one of them or if you really fall into it go through the entire thing because it really is that good. Moving on to our next news story, Sony has detailed the next major PS5 system software update where it's currently in beta. Uh, in fact, they sent out beta invites right away when they announced this on the PS blog, but uh, the big news here is that we know what's in this firmware update. In fact, the uh, change log is a decent size. We won't go over every small detail and little change in there, but we'll probably do that when there's a wide release. But in terms of the headline features, 1440p, is finally here but uh, we should go over some of the uh, fine details about 1440p so if the game supports 1440p then you'll be able to play at that resolution of course right now no games offer this as the console did not have this option so it sounds like developers can start supporting this for their rendering modes if they want but the most common scenario right now would be playing <coughs> excuse me unsupported games so for that if you're playing something that displays at a native 4k it'll be super sampled so you can expect to see some improved anti alien Releasing. Under the uh, screen and video settings though, you'll be able to test your display and see what it supports. So for 1440p, that can be used with uh, 24, 30, 60, or 120 hertz. But VRR is turned off if you're running 1440p. So there's a big caveat there for the time being. Uh, next is game lists. That's what Sony's calling it. And it's kind of like folders, but not really. So this will be an option in your game library under the collection tab. You can create up to 15 custom game lists with 100 games per game game list. They can be disc, digital, streaming, doesn't matter, but they're only in the library under the collection tab. So another another caveat there. Uh, next, they're including a feature that lets you compare stereo and 3D audio directly so you can pick which one you prefer. Um, and for game hubs, they're making the main activity card for a game and placing that next to the play game button. So in essence, the, uh, the play game button is for a cold boot and resume activity is an activity card that should take you to what you were doing last in that game if the game supports them. For some of the smaller stuff, you can request share screens when you're in a party. There is a joinable game notification that will pop up if you enter a party where a game session is active and joinable. You can quickly view a new friend's profile right after accepting their requests, and you can send stickers or voice messages from the game base card to your groups. And uh, again, there is more stuff in there, a lot of very small, minor changes and tweaks, but we'll cover all that in a separate video after the uh, wide release happens. But um, And that should be uh, as normal about a month and a half, two months, assuming nothing goes wrong in the beta, um, that's when the wide release will happen but these are all the big major changes and uh, on the surface looks good um you know i'm really surprised that 1440p is coming this soon i really expected that was 
uh, low on the totem pole, and even even more so when Sony announced uh, those two monitors, where one's 1080, one's 4K, and they're you know perfect for PS5. Which of course Sony's going to try and build them as you know great for PS5 or just as a, a PC gaming monitor. But um, you know not having 1440p when PS5 was getting a software update to include it, just that strikes me as weird. But either way. Still nice to have 1440p this early, but no VRR, that sucks. Uh, perhaps that'll be later. Um, in terms of game lists, this is something where it sounds great, but then when you find out how they're doing it, it's like, okay, well, that's not really as useful as we thought because it's stuck in the game library under the collection tab, and only the collection tab, which is all your software, right? Uh, disc, digital, installed, uninstalled, PS Plus games, and, you know, that's fine to have it there, but it's not in the install tab where, you know, those are your games that are installed ready to play. Would have been great to have it there. And, uh, well, moreover, it would have been great to have some sort of proper folder or game list functionality that you can use right on the horizontal row of icons. And, you know, combine that with the keep and home setting where you can pin them to the home screen so they don't leave depending on how many titles you're starting and stopping. Um, you know, that would have been great, but that's not what we're getting here. Perhaps that'll come later. Um, and then the activity cards being baked into a games hub you know i kind of had a feeling they were going to do something like this because as we discussed in a video like a month and a half two months ago it was all about activity cards and how i mentioned there's a problem with these i tested so many games and the behavior pattern of these cards when they're supported is so inconsistent to the point where they're really just kind of useless in fact there are more games that have cards that are pointless than games that use them, you know, the, the proper correct way where they uh, skip menus, they skip certain load screens, um, and they genuinely take you right back to your last checkpoint. Most of them act like a cold boot. And so now you've got something where Sony's baking this into the game hub and placing it right next to the play game button, and that's a cold boot. But now you've got something where, depending on how the developer has used it, you might have two buttons that do that do basically the same thing and by default the uh you know continue activity button that's going to be the default icon when you scroll down if you choose to to do so that way um it's clear that they're not seeing enough player engagement with the uh with the cards but um well, that's their problem though i mean they, they really should be mandating this behind the scenes in a way where it's like because right now it's essentially kind of they've given developers all these tools of like here's what you can do with cards go nuts and it's a, a wild west where you have cards that do cool things and cards that do nothing they really should be mandating certain behaviors where hey if you're a developer and you're going to use the cards great but here's the expected behavior and that's you know we want you to do them in a certain way where it skips you know menus it skips um, it takes somebody right to their last load screen etc etc they should be doing something like that um but that's not the case. So I'm, I'm not really a big fan of that, but uh, either way, that's what we have so far for this PS5 system software update. Uh, we'll cover more as uh, once the wide release gets closer to uh, finally being available. Next up, Sony's partnering with Backbone to offer a PlayStation edition of the Backbone 1, which is a smartphone attachment for iOS and Android, and it connects to your phone's port, and it offers uh, tactile buttons and feedback for playing smartphone games. Uh, you could do Stadia stuff, play Xbox Game Pass, and naturally you can also use it for PS4 or PS5 remote play. So Sony's partnering with Backbone to offer a PlayStation edition, which it's essentially the same thing, but now it has the PS5 sort of coat of paint, right, where it's uh, all white, it's got PlayStation buttons, and, um, you know, it just looks more like a PlayStation certified product, which uh, this is available now, you can order it, it's 100 bucks. Um, and I, I know some people like these, so it's a viable option if you don't have one just yet, at least for uh, the PlayStation version. It's only for iOS right now, which that is uh, one little, uh, that's kind of a problem though, because at least in terms of like Apple and iOS news, we're right on the cusp of, you know, Apple being forced to go with USB-C on their phones, like they, they have to do it because of what's going on in Europe and uh, that mandate. So it's not something where, I mean, it's kind of a rumor technically, but it's inevitable that they're going to switch to USB-C iPhones. So I'm not sure if this is really worth picking up right now, if you plan on upgrading your phone relatively soon, but you know, there's that to consider. And uh, you know, at least for me, uh, I would say, hey, if we're a PlayStation product here with, uh, we've got two sticks for this controller setup, 
They should be symmetric technically, although I do know people like the asymmetric sticks. Uh, so this would be a good option if you want to play some PlayStation games with asymmetric sticks, but you've also had an option of being able to use any controller with, uh, you know, third party adapters. I digress, uh, but I looked at that and I was like, oh, wait a minute, if you're a PlayStation product, those sticks those sticks should be symmetric. Um, either way, though, uh, it's available now. I'm still really not much for streaming games. I, I still think it's a, a bad experience all around, but uh, this would be way better than using, you know, on-screen touch controls. So let's, let's put it that way. It's, you know, this makes it a little bit better. Moving on to our next story, Jason Schreier of Bloomberg recently put out a new report about Knights of the Old Republic, uh, the remake that Sony announced during their uh, September showcase last year, which was announced as a PS5 console exclusive. It sounds like this game is not really doing all that good right now. So the report states that Aspire uh, fired the game's art director and design director, and the two studio heads told employees that the project is currently on pause. The game was, uh, apparently it's been in development for three years, and a vertical slice demonstration was uh, finished recently, June 30th, but that was considered unsatisfactory given how much has been spent so far. And also, Aspire was apparently telling staff and partners that the game would release by the end of 2022, but more sensible employees, we'll call them, were really saying a 2025 target is more realistic. And so right now, the game is kind of in this limbo state of Aspire might do it, it might not do it, but the game is, uh, or the project entirely is on hold, and uh, I'm not sure if this is all too surprising, because if, if you remember when the announcement initially happened during Sony's showcase, I mean, of course, it was like a big thing, right? It was their one of their openers for that um, for that live stream, and you know, it's an, it's an exciting announcement, a huge high-budget remake of a beloved title, and there was also the angle of like, oh, and Sony secured it for timed exclusivity. It's well known for being an original Xbox game, and so that was a whole thing. But you know, shortly after that uh, live stream, the more you know sensible reactions came in of like, oh, okay, but Aspire's doing it. Like they don't really have that kind of track record historically for handling high budget remakes uh, in a huge way, and so that seemed questionable. And now we've got this where. It all sort of makes sense, uh, and it also kind of doesn't. Well, at least in terms of the, the time frame, right? So uh, apparently a vertical slice done June 30th very recently, but the, the project was in development for like three years, which it's just what were you doing in three years? I mean, normally, you know, you kind of do all this stuff behind the scenes before a public announcement. Um, you know, you, you build some sort of vertical slice and you parade that around different publishers and... Uh, uh, you talk to the platform holders. You see if they're interested in the idea and the progress that's been done that's been done so far. And you know if they want to work out a deal, that's when conversations will start. So I'm not sure what this <coughs> excuse me um what this vertical slice was uh, for or what you know how far along in the process they were here. But you know hearing that and then you know other employees saying like yeah we're really like maybe three years away from really getting this thing done uh yeah this just did not seem like it was gonna pan out in a good way but as always we should remember it is considered a rumor so nothing is concrete in here just yet but um really wouldn't surprise me if that's uh, if that's what's really going on here uh, I'm just curious as to how Sony is now approaching this particular deal because we don't really know the extent of their involvement. They, it could have been a simple timed exclusivity agreement um, or perhaps they're really overseeing the project in a, a much more meaningful way. But in terms of you know how they're going to approach this, I, I'm sure they're definitely part of those conversations. So we'll see how they decide to go about handling it moving forward. Now, if you remember, there was a Steam database listing for Returnal, where it didn't outright say Returnal, it said Oregon, but on there, there was many uh, obvious references to things in Returnal, like Helios, Atropos, the Tower of Sisyphus. Um, it was uh, a listing for Returnal, and we also had a screenshots leak out. Uh, I forget when it was, but we saw you know Returnal's PC settings and things like that. So the game's coming at some point. But uh, this news is about how the uh, database listing has. It's been updated a lot recently uh, on a daily basis, and there's even uh, references in there to Steam Deck support. So the game is likely going to be uh, you know, deck verified from the onset, and it's going to work no problem. And so we might see a, a release, uh, not a release date, but a, a proper reveal relatively soon, which 
you know, for Eternal, and also thinking that, uh, you know, we could play the game on Steam Deck, which that much I think was obvious, but, you know, having uh, the game work without any problems at all whatsoever, um, that's, that's enticing. Uh, for me, at least, I got my Steam Deck reservation in, like, kind of late, so I still am waiting on an email, but, um, Playing this game on that I think would be super dope, but you know, outside of that, uh, it's something where I'll always uh, advocate for Returnal, so if you haven't played it just yet, uh, play it on your PS5 or play it when the PC version inevitably comes out. Uh, now, speaking of PC releases, we can also mention that for The Last of Us Part 1, which is coming out on PC shortly after PS5, we just don't know how long that might take. Uh, might be sooner than we think based on what was said on Twitter from uh, one of Naughty Dog's senior environment uh, texture artists, where they say, uh, when responding to a fan, they say, Glad to hear you're hyped, man. PC version should come out a bit later, but very soon after the PS5 release, which you know, that PS5 release is September, so that's already right around the corner. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of interpretation left up to very soon, but I read that as uh, at least by the end of this year, you would uh, you would figure, right? So shouldn't be too long of a wait. It still gives them a decent amount of time after the September release, but um, if you remember with uh, one of Sony's last uh, financial reports, how they're expecting a huge bump in PC revenue, which you know, a large part of that is going to be the uh, Spider-Man remastered release in August and um, Miles Morales still being expected in fall of this year. So Sony's got a lot left here, uh, but they were expecting a huge jump in their PC revenue, uh, $300 million. So between Spider-Man, uh, I could also see The Last of Us Part 1 contributing to that number because it is a huge jump from what they did previously. So uh, perhaps that game will be here on time before the year closes out. Moving on to one of our other big news stories here, but Sony shared more details about PSVR 2 on the PlayStation blog, which, uh, you know, I'm surprised that we still have not gotten a, you know, a live stream properly showcasing the headset and more games. But we're getting there. We did see Horizon and a few other things, and developers on their own can start announcing PSVR 2 titles, which... There's uh, definitely a few now at this point. I'm kind of uh, keeping a running list, but um, anyway, the point is we got another PS blog post, uh, this time about the PSVR 2's uh, user experience. So Sony talked about you know what it's like to use and set up the headset, certain features, and they also shared some screenshots. So you can see that for the basic PSVR 2 menu when you're playing games, you have options to adjust your uh, surroundings. You can view, view your surroundings. There's the system screen size, VR headset vibration toggle, set play area, adjust visibility, and uh, for actually viewing your surroundings, you can either press the function button right on the headset or use the card in the control center, and that will switch to the camera so you can see your surroundings without taking the headset off. Super useful there. You can also use the PS5's HD camera to stream yourself playing, and uh, this is gonna be an incredibly easy way to capture VR gameplay with you in the shot overlaid on the gameplay. And believe me, recording VR stuff is usually a huge headache, so this might be the most uh, useful thing the HD camera could be used for. Then there's the... Um, the customizable play area so you can use the headsets cameras to scan the room that you're playing in and then you can adjust your boundaries with the psvr 2 sense controllers and with this set you'll then receive warnings if you are too close to exiting your play area and this is a that's another huge quality of life improvement you know anyone who's used the first psvr also knows that's a very finicky aspect of using that headset at times um, and then like the first PSVR, you could just use your PS5 with uh, 2D content in a cinematic mode, and that will be displayed at 1920 by 1080 with HDR. It will also support 24, 60, or 120 hertz. And at the bottom of the PS blog post, Sony says, we'll share more details soon, including launch date and additional games coming to the platform. So it shouldn't be too much longer of a wait, uh, especially when we look at that running timeline that, you know, many were theorizing of like, okay, we're hearing this thing. They're targeting, you know, holiday 2022. Now that seems very unlikely based on lead time and also developers uh, working on software. It's likely more of a Q1 2023 kind of thing. And that's still fine because that's very close as well. So we should 
be getting uh, PSVR 2 announcements very soon, which, um, you know, to dial back to what I said uh, at the start of the story, where I'm surprised we still have not gotten a, um, a PSVR 2 reveal and live stream or something. Uh, one point I've seen brought up before, and it's a very good one, it's that um, PSVR 2 may not have its own live stream per se, but it will be, you know, continuously lumped together with uh, other, you know, standard 2D PS5 announcements like we saw with PSVR, actually, you know, many gameplay announcements and trailers and all that stuff, right? Um, you know, on its own, it would go up on the PS blog and YouTube and whatnot, but you would see PSVR stuff show up in State of Plays and even prior to that, E3. So, um, same deal here where uh, if you announce a PSVR 2 only showcase, unfortunately, VR still definitely is not a mass market thing and the interest level isn't isn't nearly as high so if you do that not many people are going to show up to that live stream you kind of have to you know do more psvr2 announcements in general state of plays uh next to all the massive third party and first party announcements so and in fact likely we might get just that not its own showcase but it will show up in uh, a, a different state of play or uh, the expected PlayStation Showcase that we'll get eventually, which right now we're hearing something might show up in August. But outside of that, in terms of what we saw in this blog post, it all sounds great. It, um, you know, again, it's all the little things that um, really breaks down those barriers of what of what is so annoying about the current headset. Um, so again, I don't have a huge problem with the one wire. That's way better than what we had before. Being able to scan your play area, the tracking just naturally being much more reliable, having the, the pass through so you can see where you're going and what you're doing. If you wanna just pick up the controllers or even pick up a drink or the remote or, or whatever, right? It's just, it's so many little things that they're fixing with this headset that make it that much more accessible to um, you know have the motivation to put it on and play it because I still love VR. I, I genuinely have a great time with it every single time I play, but um, you know, for the first PSVR headset, it it is definitely a chore. You gotta be in the mood for it. And also the tracking is just, it is such a massive pain. I just cannot wait to start using uh, this new one. And as a small little jumping off point, not necessarily a separate news story here, but uh, the MetaQuest 2, you know, recently had a price increase, uh, which, you know, Facebook is kind of like push, pushing the blame on the bill of materials. Like it, it just costs more to make. Um, so there's still, a question to be there's still something to be said about the possible price tag of this thing you know i wouldn't say any more than 500 but i would also be highly suspect of anything below 500 just to sort of put it out there right away i mean sony might get very aggressive and do 450 or 400 but i can't see this thing not being a costly device um that's just you know where we are nowadays but um I'm still excited, but uh, it shouldn't be too much longer of a wait to see more PSVR 2. Now, the other big news story that we had was the IDOS Montreal founder speaking with GamesIndustry.biz, talking about the company's, you know, turbulent history, their relationship with Square Enix and how it wasn't that good after the acquisition, um, the eventual sale to Embracer Group, the price tag, all that stuff. Um, very interesting read, but there's one part in there that caught a lot of attention this week, which was the founder talking about rumors of Sony possibly looking at an acquisition and Square setting themselves up for that. So they were quoted saying, if I read between the lines, Square Enix Japan was not as committed as we hoped initially. And there are rumors, obviously, that with all these activities of mergers and acquisitions, that Sony would really like to have Square Enix within their wheelhouse. I heard rumors that Sony said they're really interested in Square Enix Tokyo, but not the rest. So I think Matsuda-san put it like a garage sale in reference to the very cheap price of uh, all those Western studios being sold to Embracer Group, which that is something we talked about when that news initially broke out, is that you know, it seemed very cheap for what Embracer was getting, a lot of IP, a lot of uh, talent, and well also how it seemed like Square was maybe trying to get out of the Western business, and really it did seem like that for quite a bit anyway, because that's what this whole conversation dives into. But this was also very close to those rumors about Square possibly being acquired by Sony. If you remember, that was uh, that rumor initially was from Jeff Grubb and Greg Miller, and they both held back because, as we've you know discussed so many times before, you know acquisition rumors just aren't normally a thing because that news just does not really slip out early ahead of time. At the very very minimum, it might 
might be like a day of sort of thing before a press release goes out where more and more people day of are, are learning about it. But anyway, there was something very close to this news this week, which was only a few weeks ago where, uh, well, actually, I think the job posting was a few months ago, but Sony was looking for a senior director competition in regulatory affairs. And this particular position, uh, one line says here, and I quote, you will be responsible for leading SIA's efforts to comply with the competition laws globally and for managing and supervising regulatory investigations and proceedings worldwide, including interfacing with governmental and regulatory agencies on a broad range of issues, including competition, consumer protection, product safety, packaging and labeling, and directing overall case and matter strategy. And there's many other responsibilities in there, but this position was actually filled recently confirmed by Bloomberg Law, where uh, an antitrust lawyer previously of Uber and Microsoft, they were hired and brought in. Uh, and this was Sony's gaming division. So this was a Sony interactive entertainment hire. That was the job listing. And this job is filled, which, you know, it's not surprising at all. We knew that Sony was indeed going to be looking into more merger and acquisition. It's not at all over for Sony, Microsoft, Tencent, Embracer, there's going to be more. Um, and we do have to remember that these deals can take quite a bit to put together. So we're talking months, sometimes upwards of a year or longer. So in the case of, you know, Square, where if this is really happening and they have to trim down uh, Western studios to look better to a prospective buyer like Sony, you know, that could take quite a while, right? So um, right now, the merger and acquisition activity seems to be, you know, pretty quiet now, but that's just sort of implying that all those conversations are happening behind the scenes and deals are being drafted up and uh, we could we could see this stuff uh, pop up again in waves um, within the next you know six months to a year um, for Sony we know they have quite a decent chunk of money set aside for activity in the space and they've also gone on record to say that if an opportunity arises they will certainly exceed that budget if uh, if it is a good opportunity so I'm not sure what else we can really add here um, outside of what we talked about the last time the story came up. It's something where I do feel that eventually Sony will get there and pick up a very, very big, uh, they'll do a very big purchase that is uh, as shocking or as surprising as Microsoft picking up Bethesda, which, you know, that at the time seemed like, you know, huge, like nothing's going to top that. And then it was Activision, um, which I, <laughs> Sony's not going to quite get to that sort of level. Uh, but Bungie was a pretty big deal. And at least in terms of how Sony would go about picking up a big publisher, it would likely look just like Bungie in that it would be an entity next to, uh, it would be under Sony Interactive Entertainment, but they would not be PlayStation Studios. Those developers would more or less operate as they, they normally would. So they would be shipping on Nintendo, Xbox, PC. Um, you know, the, the deal really is, it would mean a multitude of other things for Sony outside of just, you know, securing some exclusive games and exclusive properties for their own platforms. Um, the line of thinking is just different nowadays. And so with, with Sony, I think that is how they would go about doing it. And at least for Square, they do fit the bill the best compared to other publishers because Sony is not in the business of picking up a struggling developer or publisher in this case, right? They're not looking to jump in and, you know, fix up Ubisoft or um, save a struggling EA that's uh, been putting out a lot of uh, questionable releases in recent years. They're not looking to do that, right? They want something that's uh, trimmed down, that's in a healthy state, that has a lot of uh, unique talent and opportunity to fill, you know, certain holes that are really missing or certain areas or genres or types of software that Sony is uh, really lacking in. And, you know, Square certainly can fit that in a number of ways where um, it just, it makes sense if it were to happen. Not saying it's going to, but I would not be surprised at all if that is the big announcement that Sony, you know, picks up a publisher and it, and it ends up being Square. At this point, I would not be surprised at all. Moving on to our next news story, over on the SIA corporate blog, Sony has announced a brand new initiative for independent developers outside of PlayStation where if you are a newly registered and uh, new partner on PlayStation, you are eligible for a loan program of one PS5 dev kit and one PS5 test unit, which 
uh, could be a very attractive offer to the right person, to the right team. Um, it sounds like a much more streamlined process and there are, you know, terms and conditions to that loan of how long you can have them and, you know, there's possibly an option to reimburse Sony and keep them and keep working. I would assume there's something in there, but it's uh, it sounds like a more streamlined process versus what Sony has historically done, which they do have a good relationship with Indies in that they've, you know, offered loan programs and free dev kits and exchange for exclusivity and things like that they've you know always done things on a case-by-case -case basis but this does seem a bit more streamlined to court developers that are currently outside of playstation and the way that they're offering just one you know dev kit one test unit this could appeal to very small teams or one person teams more or less right um kind of goes back to that story from summer 2021 which was um you know how Sony wasn't really supporting uh, small indie devs and you know to this day I still see people reference that story and they they misconstrue it or they get it wrong uh, saying that of course Sony you know supports indie devs look at Kana look at Sifu look at Stray look at this and, and but the thing is that that report was never about those kinds of games because yes they're indie but they command a seven figure budget and they can have teams of 10 to 20 30 people they're indie, sure, but you know that's not really what that story was about. That story was about very small teams, and so repairing those relationships are important, and also this would be a great way to court more developers that are in that sense of, of scale, right? If they're one, two-person teams, um, this could be very attractive to them. So more indie support is always great. I'm for it from all platform holders. Um, you know, indies are sometimes the home of the most unique and creative ideas in this business. So absolutely, I'm 100% for this. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories that I wanted to talk about you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was my Stray Platinum Trophy playthrough. So yeah, that was, uh, that was a great game. Really loved it. And since playing it, um, it's still like in my head. Like I kind of want to jump into the PS4 version right away. But um, yeah, you can go check out the reactions and that whole playthrough if you want. But uh, as always another upload on Tuesday. So until then, that is it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.